All right, welcome back everybody. Hope you had a, a nice break and uh, that you're ready for action. You've already been in action down in the clinic. So the idea here is that I'm going to take you on to the next stage. Um, you, you can't hear. So the people over at the far corner, two. Can you hear me in the far corner? You can, okay. So like you're on the screen, and I'd like to know that you're not talking amongst yourselves so that we, so I've got your attention. Um, so you've been downstairs taking impressions of each other, correct? Okay. And you understood why you were taking the impressions? Do you understand what appliances are being uh, made on the models that we're about to pour? You do understand? I'm just going to reiterate that. We're going to make a mouth guard on these. Okay. We're also going to make a, a potentially make a bleaching tray and maybe even a splint okay so you need to treat these impressions uh, very carefully and if you can get more than one pour so what i'm going to show you is a way for you to get more than one pour otherwise you may need to duplicate them or you may need to retake an impression downstairs were you taken through how to assess your impressions for the various appliances Okay, so what I'd like to do is take some impressions from people and run through how you would assess whether those, those impressions are correct for what you're going to do. So would someone like to volunteer their impression? So the first appliance that we're going to make is a mouth guard. So we'd like to assess, first of all, whether the, the impression that we've taken is good enough to, to make a mouth guard on. So would anyone like to volunteer how, uh, what we're lo looking for with a mouth guard impression? Okay, because we need to know that when we walk away from a patient in the clinic that we have the right impression because we see too many times an impressions arrive in a laboratory to fabricate an appliance and then I've got to ring the, the, the uh, practitioner and say, sorry we can't make this appliance because you haven't um, you haven't given us the right impression to do that so we're going to have a look at this impression now and check out exactly what we need to be looking for the most important thing with an impression this is presuming that it's a class one occlusion and you're going to be making the mouth guard on the maxillary model okay the most important area for you to look at here is this area above the central incisors through here to the sixes and to look to see if you've captured the eminence the root eminence of each teeth if you haven't captured that then you need to consider going down and retaking that impression at the, your next sitting in the clinic okay because this impression is not good enough to make a mouth go on. so if i'm assessing this We've got nicely here, just above the eminence, and there, and there. Uh, all of this is okay, but when we get to the two and the three here, you can see that that is deficient. Okay, so ideally, if you had a patient in the chair, and you took this out of the mouth, and you looked at that, you're going to say, okay, this is not good enough. Sorry, Bill, Eric, whatever your patient's name is, I'm going to retake this impression. Can you guys help guide me if I get out of this camera? So we're looking, making sure that we look at this. If it's on the lower, in other words, if it's an extreme class three and we're making the mouth guard on the lower because the patient is like that, occurs very rarely, but it does occur, particularly if you like uh, I am and you're going out and taking lots of professional footballers like we did last week with the Titans and the week before with the Broncos and next week again with the Broncos. There, are the, there is the odd uh, person who has extreme class three. We then make the major protective guard on the lower and we make a small lighter guard on the upper, but they occlude together, okay? So I'm going to look at this and check out exactly the same. Have I got it over the root eminences of, from the six to the six in this case? And to the seven, if the four, to the seven, if the four or uh, five is missing. Okay, we're going to the seven. So in this case, we're looking here to see that there's two premolars. So we're only going to go to the sixes and we've got it this side, but we don't have it this side. Okay, now the, the tendency is to say it's only a mouth guard, but this is the very best preventative dentistry that you will ever do. It prevents more injuries than any other single thing that you will do in dentistry. It prevents more um, 
uh, injuries than seat belts. I mean, in, in, in teeth terms, okay, for sports people. So it's very important that if you're going to make a guard, you to get the impression corre made correctly, and then that you prescribe the right mouth guard for the, for the patient. So we're going to look at that to make sure that we've got all that area um, captured. If we don't have it captured, if we look at your impression and we say, okay, we're missing this bit here, th what is the next thing that we're going to do before we take the next impression? Any ideas? There's a lot we can tell from this impression. If I just pick up the same tray again and retake the impression, then I'm going to get the same result. And I'll tell you why. If I look carefully at this impression, can you see the breakthrough here? And can you see the breakthrough here? Sorry. See the breakthrough area here in the alginate and the breakthrough there. That's a telltale sign to say that this tray couldn't be seated up because it's contacting the eminence, the very strong eminence on the seven, the six, seven area, okay? Which is very strong. That means if we choose this same tray, or if at least we don't alter this tray, we will get the same result over and over again. So always with every impression you take, not only do you look to see that it's captured in this case, all the area that you want for the mouth guard, but you also troubleshoot so that if you're retaking it, you don't repeat the same mistake. Most important. It becomes even more important with crown and bridge because you, if you don't look at why the, the tray went wrong, you've got a patient at the end of a very long appointment where they've had preps cut and sometimes multiple preps cut and you miss with the impression, you look at it and you say, I've got to retake it. Please analyse that because most of my days with the uh, fifth years and, and uh, late fourth years who are doing impressions down for Crown and Bridge, most of my day is spent saying, this is not good enough, come up and talk to me. When they come up, I say, why do you think it didn't work? And they go, oh, don't know, did not have enough tray material in or whatever. And nearly always it's something as simple as this, they've chosen the wrong size tray or they haven't adapted the tray. Now in this case, if the arch is fitting from here to here, but it's just touching there, I would simply take the same size tray, whatever that is, a number three tray, and I would take my torch, and in this area here, just warm the tray up, and then flex it out, and then quench it, and then do the same on this side, and then try it in, and making sure that it goes up completely at the back. Because all that happened with this impression was that you couldn't take it all the way up because the tray was too small. And then you'll capture the whole of this area uh, this area across the front. So most important that you learn with every impression that you take to self-assess. Don't rely on the clinicians downstairs. Call them over and say, I don't think this is good enough. That's you making a statement about the quality of the work that you want to produce. I don't think this is good enough. And I think it's not good enough because I, and then go through the reasons and then get them to confirm that. Now, some of the clinicians will say, oh, I think that's good enough. They can extrapolate that on the model, okay? It's up to you as to whether you have, have a debate about that with them. Now, you're perfectly liberty to say, look, I've got time. Would you mind if I retook it, okay? If you're up against it and so you have a negotiation with your clinician, but you have the right to set a high standard for yourself if you wish and you can negotiate that with your supervisor downstairs. So please assume the top end assume the top end and say, okay, if, I, if I'm not happy with it, I'm just going to retake it. Because when you go out into practice, if you've internalized that behavior, you will be in the top 5%, not the bottom 5% having to take the dirt jobs with big chains who give you nothing to work with and send you out bush all the time, okay? So if you don't want to be that person, start internalizing that behavior with your patients right now. It'd be really good. Do you agree with that, Mark? Yeah. Okay, so that's... So make sure that you analyze if your impression went wrong. We're happy to look at your impressions and, and see if they're adequate for this mouth guard. Now the mouth guard is the one that's going to need the most extension. If we're going to make a splint, there's one other thing that we would like. A splint, by the simple nature of, the, of what the device is doing, this is, if it's a, a, a full coverage splint, a Michigan splint, which is what we would be doing, it's the most used splint. So if we're doing that, the things we're looking for is that you've captured 
the crown of every tooth that you're making the splint on. So if you're making it on the upper, the crown area, and at least four millimeters beyond the gingiva, not the eminences, just four millimeters beyond the gingiva, in the palate particularly, and at least the, the cap, at least capturing the, the full crown, the gingival roll, in other words, on the buckle. Okay, we don't extend down over that on the on the buckle with the with a um, splint. So if you've got mouth guard coverage, you've definitely got enough for splint. But we now need to look to see that we have every tooth in the arch, because with the splint we must cover every tooth in the arch that it's being made on, and we must touch every tooth in the opposing arch against that splint to stop over eruption when the splint's being worn. So you're looking at your lower impression or your opposing, depending on some people prescribe splints on lowers and, and, and uh, other people will talk to you about when to do that. But we're looking to capture this tooth and this tooth, the occlusal surface, all of the occlusal surface. And this is very dubious here. You can see we've just missed that lingual cusp. And again, if I analyze this, we can see total breakthrough in this area here and this area here. So the tray was too small. It's hit the oblique external ridge and we couldn't seed it down. So we didn't capture this tooth. Your tray selection and fitting before you take the impression is absolutely crucial. If you can't get that tray to sit completely down on the teeth all the way around, either adapt the tray or take a bigger size, check that the bigger size can be placed into the mouth correctly. Okay? If it can't, you take the smaller size and adapt it. All right? So if you've got someone with a big rubbery embouchure and, they, and you can move their lips all around, you'll just take the bigger tray to make sure you've captured everything. If they don't have that, if they have a smaller opening, you're going to adapt the smaller tray out in that area so that you can take uh, an accurate impression. So in this one here, I'd be worried about that cusp there for the splint, and I would be particularly worried because that's the area where a small contact that's out of whack is going to be a large opening at the front because it's right at the back and the patient's closed like that and they can't close up correctly. Okay. So that's what we're looking for, for the splint. For the bleaching tray, we simply want to capture a millimetre and a half over the gingiva in the area where we're going to be bleaching. So if the, you're only doing the six anteriors, we just want to capture those teeth. If you're doing the upper and lower, capture those teeth. It's a lot simpler. So if you've got one that works for a splint and one that works for a mouth guard, you've almost certainly got one that's going to work for your bleaching trays. Okay? If the year goes well, we will we'll, we'll produce all of those appliances on these. Okay, so once you've analysed your impression, what, what I'd like you to do is analyse your own impression now with that information and reassess it and then talk to anyone if you're concerned about that and we'll have a look. And it may be that we get you to put, in fact, we will definitely get you to pour that impression uh, anyway. I will get you not to look at your impressions just at the moment. I'm going to go ahead and pour an impression so that you see how it's poured. I'm just going to pour the upper impression so that you can practice on the lower and then I'll pour someone else's lower impression so you can see how that's done. So with this impression that we're pouring here, the idea is that we want to pour all of the detail in here accurately without any bubbles. We want to pour all of the detail in here that you've captured without any bubbles. We want the mix to be a dense, strong mix, okay? And then we want to have the base of the model thick enough so that it is robust enough to go through all the processes we're going to take it through. In other words, adapting a mouth guard, adapting a, a bleaching tray, and then making a splint. We will get you to pour all of your, I'm presuming that, that all of you are class one or class two, that we will pour the upper model more than once if we possibly can. And I'll show you how we can do that now when I pour this and, and uh, carefully get that, that model poured so that you can pour it twice um, if possible. Okay? So the things that influence the, 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 uh, the way that this material works are the ratio that you mix it at. In other words, how sloppy or how thick it is. Okay, there's an optimum measurement and it's kind of, it, we could measure it out as per the specifications on the sheet, but the relative increase and decrease in the strength is very minor within a range. So we prefer for you to visually
be able to assess that and I'll show you how to do that. But basically we're going to mix it to a heavy cream consistency. And I say heavy because most of you will mix your mix too runny so that when we go to turn this, it slumps and we don't have a thick base. Okay, we don't want that situation because we can't work with that model. We then have to pour a new base to it. It happens with about 90% of impressions that come from dental surgeries. They all pour too thin because practitioners aren't teaching their dental nurses or whoever pours the impressions in their surgery correctly. You can help if you're a practitioner either by pouring your own or teaching your ancillary staff well so that your lab isn't getting these impressions with a model that's not adequate for them and then they have to charge you to rebase the model. No point in pouring your model, you might as well pack it up and send it straight to the laboratory like probably 80% of practitioners do anyway. They don't pour their own models. But if you're in that situation, lots of uh, new graduates are in a situation where they're told they have to pour their own models. You want to be able to do what I'm going to show you. Okay, so we want to mix it to the right consistency so that we can manage it. The right consistency so it is the right strength. We want to exclude as much as many of the bubbles so it is strong. Is everyone cool with that? We could vacuum mix it, but there's no requirement for the appliances that we're making to have a vacuum mix model. They can be made plenty strong enough in the method that we're going to be doing here. Okay, so now I'm going to just pause this. We're going to take the camera over so that you can see one and a half. So one for the impression and half for the base. Okay, so we're going to, for the first impression, you're going to mix just one for one model and pour it. I don't want you to rush that. We want you to see that you can do that correctly. We're going to use this spatula here, which is the plaster spatula as against the plastic ones, which are your alginate spatulas. So this is the better one to use. And then we're going to add the water. And here is the absolutely crucial thing. I need to start, once I start adding the water, the setting time of this has started. We need to work reasonably quickly. So it means you can't talk to your neighbor. The longer you stir, the faster the plaster sets. Dr. Foster or whoever took you for material science should have explained that to you. So the more energy you put in, the more turns you do here, the faster it's going to set, which means when you get towards the end, when you need the time, you won't have it because it's setting very quickly, okay? The runnier you mix it, the slower it sets, but the weaker the model is. If you mix it too thick, you're not going to be able to manage it to get it to run around the impression without including bubbles in the sharp corners of the teeth. So we want the optimum mix here. And so this is where, how you do this. Take your time and add the water until you get it to the optimum thickness. Creamy thickness. Now, I've put a, a bit too much water in there. So I'm going to take a little bit of this and add it. You can tell almost straight away if you've, if you've made it too too runny. It would be better if I didn't put that in. Then as soon as I've got all of the, the bubbles, out, the dryness out of it like that, as soon as I've got it out, I stop mixing and then I start it on the vibrator. I like the vibration to be about like that. So this is just not just off bouncing. Okay, and then let the bubbles come to the top. You can see them coming to the top there now. Then we're going to take our impression. It's been wet. That does two things. It washes out the disinfecting solution out of there. The disinfecting solution will affect the surface of your stone. It will be powdery if you don't get rid of that. Then I'm going to get rid of excess out of there. Don't blow it with the hose. Just make sure that you see no water puddled in there, but you can see that it's wet. That makes the surface so that this will flow across it. It's wetted the surface. Okay, and then we're going to take this and with that freely vibrating, we're going to put it there and we're going to watch it run into the impression like that and see how I'm watching the front edge and I can control the front edge and how fast it moves. Is that visual for everybody to see? Now, when we come around the anterior teeth, 
it's even more important for me to control the flow like this. See how I can move my impression and get it to move? But I am watching it go in and out of every corner of the tooth. I can see it running and it's running a bit fast. If it flops in, if I do this and it goes bang, bang, bang like that, I immediately just run it back and say, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I'm going to run it back out of those teeth until I can see that it's a thin layer and then run it back again. Okay? So don't accept that it just ran and think, oh, well, I'll cross my fingers and hope that I got it. Because with this alginate impression that we want to pour twice, we want you to have no bubbles at all in your impression the first time. So you can pour it a second time and you'll end up with two nice models for the price of one. Okay, so once I have covered the whole of that area, I'm just going to put a little bit more there and push it out to that heel. You can see that what I'm trying to do here is over the whole of the model get a nice even base. Okay, then I'm going to switch that off and we're going to move this up onto there. Now if you keep bumping that it will sag out. Can you see that this has volume to it and can you see how I pushed it off I did not do this okay I want to build it up so that I can place my impression on it and move the impression down to the right thickness so we take the stone we're pushing it off and heaping it up like so Once we've got it up like that, we can then turn this impression like this and just sit it on the top. And can you see how it's sitting on its own? We've got profile, too much profile. Then I just look and see where it's deficient, where I've got coverage and where I haven't. I haven't got coverage back under here or under here, but it's touching here. So if I take my fingers and move it towards the front, I've repositioned it in the, in the base and now I've got material there and there. I've got material almost all around. What we're looking for is a thickness of at least 12 millimetres at the deepest part of the vault. 12 millimetres. So I know that these teeth are roughly horizontal to this tray. You can check that beforehand if your impression was touching at the back then we can put this down a little bit more at the back like so and then I'm looking and seeing what I've got how much coverage I've got all the way around we don't need anything you can use your plaster knife for the next stage if you wish but I'm happy for you to use this so we're now going to go around and make sure that we've just got this up to the impression all of the way around We don't want it to come up the sides of the alginate because we won't be able to get this off and re-pour it if you've got it wrapping up the sides. We just need this to come out to the full length of the sulcus. This is not a muscle trimmed impression like you would have if you have a full full denture where we're trying to capture the peripheries. We don't need the peripheries for any of these appliances that we're making. So we want the model to come down and just to go out to the full depth and then we want it to stop. We don't want it to come up the side and prevent us from getting this off cleanly and repouring it. Is everyone following my logic for these preliminary, what we call preliminary models? Okay, so if you've got it wrapping up over the tray, at this stage you're going to take it off. We're just going to make sure that it's coming up to the alginate but not wrapping over the alginate and that it's supported all the way around. Once I've done that, I'm going to leave it set. If I keep bumping it and playing with it and taking more off at this stage, it's just going to go like this and we'll end up with a thin base. Can you see again, the important thing is this thickness, the creamy thickness, otherwise I wouldn't be able to do all of those things. If it's too runny, you'll put it on there and it'll just go straight through the base. The weight of this is considerable depending on the size of the mouth, of course. Okay. So that's how we do the pour. We're going to show you how to trim and prep the model at, at a later stage. I'm now going to do someone else's lower impression. Do you mind that for me and bringing it back? So 
Okay, someone got a lower impression that they would like to donate. Thank you. Could you just, uh, yeah, run around. There's a tap just there. So, with the lower impression, the guide for how thick the base is going to be comes from the depth of the lingual sulcus. So we're going to have a look at that lingual sulcus, see how deep that is, and that's where our model is going to be measured 12 millimetres from, because that will be the thinnest part, agree? So the mix is going to be the same as what we did last time, the vibration is the same, but there's going to be a little change in the way that we set up the base, and I'll show you how we do that right now. Thank you. So again, we're going to go a scoop and a half. And then I'm going to be a little bit more careful with the addition of the water this time and see if we can get it right. Now, you will be taught other, other methods by other um, demonstrators sometimes. Take on board what they say, because my method is what I've developed as a combination of being a practitioner as well as doing a lot of teaching and what will achieve exactly a, a consistent model for people who are starting out into model pouring. If I was pouring eight or nine models, which we would do at the end of the day when all the models come in, I'm going to treat it differently. But this is what will get you a consistent, accurate result. And it's mostly what you will use in your surgeries if you're pouring your own impressions. Okay? Notice how I stopped mixing as soon as I had the dry spots out of the, out of the mix. Most important, because if there's one thing that I see consistently every year, is someone chatting to their neighbour and just sitting there mixing away and waiting for a vibrator. Don't mix until you know that you have your vibrator ready to go and no one's in your road, okay? Or at least access to it. You can see the bubbles coming to the top. Can you see where our model has got to be 12 millimetres from there to there? That's the depth of our model. And now we're going to do exactly the same thing. We've flicked out the excess water and we're going to run this in. Start it any way you like as long as you watch it go into those teeth and then you're watching the front edge. We're going to work back. Sorry, I'm going to work back this way first and make sure that I've got this edge. Done nicely. And then I'm going to flow it forward this way. Okay, thanks Connie. Here's the difference with the lower. I'm going to place this here and I'm going to work that. See how I'm watching this way? How I'm watching the front edge. I don't just go boom like that because I'll capture a big bubble under it. I'll do it again on this side. Place it here, then see how I'm pushing it forward so I don't forward a bit. Yeah. Okay, I'm placing it and then pushing it. Pushing it forward. Sorry, guys. Okay. Now, the next thing is I want to put an extra bit there and an extra bit here. And you'll see why in just a moment. So on the heel area, I put an extra bit. Can you see how it's holding itself up because I got the mix right? If your mix isn't right, just add a bit more. Don't go ahead and, and panic. Just add a bit more until the mix is right. Then we're going to place our base. And now with this one, I am going to just move it out to look like the shape of the impression. So there's going to be a heel here, a heel here, and the front there like so okay then when i turn this those two blobs that i put there immediately give me support under the heel this is the area where most lower impressions fail people don't capture that heel and that area there is very important particularly if we've got that last tooth in the arch and we want 
the chance to have a good look at that and make sure that it's going to work for a splint. Okay, again, I'm going to move this, look at where I'm deficient and move it backwards and forwards to get it nice and centered. If it's too much over the edge, like it's going to grip the tray, I'm going to take it back. But can you see how I don't work it too much because the whole thing will sag. Here, I don't want it gripping the tray just there. See how it's going to grip the tray and be hard to get off, but I do want that heel built up there. And around the front, I'm just a little bit short there. I'm just lifting it up. But again, I'm only to the alginate. I don't want it going up over the tray. Don't be confused between a preliminary impression and a second uh, and a um, sorry a, a dentate primary impression and a dentulous secondary impression where we want to capture that periphery. Okay. Now the last thing, and this will make your life very easy, is someone got a plaster knife uh, there. I just this is just a bit wide. Uh, it's a bit wide. Something a, a wax knife or a plaster knife or that's all right. There's a wax knife there. You could take either of these. Now see in here. I can see my lingual sulcus, but this has risen above the lingual sulcus. See that there? I'm just going to drag that excess out. Can you see it or not? <laughs> Quickly developing into a comedy session. Can you see? That will save you having to try and chisel it out later. And so on. it takes you three seconds now. And it also tells you that this is about 12 millimeters thick because I can see the extension of the impression here and I can make this parallel to that. Okay? We don't want to undermine the impression. I can just see just in there, I might have pulled it away a bit, so I'm just adding that into there and over here. Now I'm demonstrating and talking to you and still had plenty of time to pour this impression. If you don't talk to your neighbour and you switch on the focus button once you start to mix, you will have no problems. If you don't switch on the focus button just for that short period of time, then you will have problems. Okay? If you learn to do this consistently, you will be confident to pour your own study models into surgery. It makes you, it gives you so many options. Um, all of the good practitioners will pour their own models or have them poured correctly, and then they can study them, and then they write their notes and send them to us and say, "Listen." I'm thinking this, what do you think? You know, but they've got it in front of them. It really helps you as a, as a practitioner if you, want to, if you want to develop this. Okay, now, one more thing I'm going to do. So can we wash that again? Notice I put that up there when this was vibrating. If this was down on that bench, it would have collapsed. It would have sagged in. So make sure that once you, you have an area where you're going to move your appliance to, um, if it's... If it's um, if the bench is going to vibrate. Okay, you're in a surgery where you don't have a vibrator. Vibrator, what's that? Oh no, we don't have a vibrator, we don't do that in our surgery. Okay, or you've gone home and you've got the impressions, you had to go straight home because you've got a, a dinner date and you've taken these home and you think, oh, I'll pour them at home. Great, we're going to pour them at home, we do it. We don't have a vibrator, but we do have an old tea towel that we can throw on the bench and we do have a soup bowl, okay. And we have a spoon. We don't have our spatula at home because we forgot to bring that in the rush to get out the door. But we always keep a little bit of stain at home because that's what dentists and dental technicians do. Okay? So, in we go with the bit and a half. In with the water. Same process. Get ourselves a nice mix like this. Someone else has got an upper impression they want to give me, please. Can they run around and rinse it? Okay, here's how we vibrate it. We're going to put this on our kitchen bench, on the tea towel, and we just do that. Okay, same thing. Does it very efficiently. Okay, yep, who's going to... Yep, we're going to rinse it. In, in. Here, actually, I'll just do it here. Just go to rinse that in here. So it's nice and wet. Okay, so I've got a model that I'm going to pour there. Out it comes. Okay, and then I'm simply going to take this. I've made this a bit thick, so it'll be a test of how well this system works. I'm going to put a bit there, and then on a hard surface, just hit the tray handle. 
Is that visual to everyone? You can pour, and I regularly pour at home if uh, someone's been on a run, and um, or if I've been been asked on my way back from visiting a surgery to do a pickup somewhere, I will take a job home, and I don't have a vibrator, but I can pour a model just like this at home. See it working its way around, in and out of every tooth. There's even air bubbles there, but you watch it push those air bubbles. See the, see the bubbles in those teeth there? It'll push them forward and out of the teeth. Same technique of filling up this area and pushing it forward. And a bit over the heels. Like so. Okay. Now, do I have enough for a base? No. When I add in and mix like this later, this bit that I'm mixing is going to set faster than the previous mix because it already has a crystalline structure to bond to. So I have to move a little bit quicker on that. So again, I'm just going to, whoop, we don't want that to sag. Nice dense mix, put my base out. So I'm showing you this so that it gives you another weapon in your bow so that if you go into any situation in any surgery, and this has come from particularly from our experience this year, it seems that the more that um, the more competitive it is out there, the less that the less that a lot of um, uh, principles 